welcome to a live episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. What's up, SDS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. Uh, this is a big day for several monumental reasons. Number one, praying that our Fisher Price microphone here holds up. So far, it has been sounding uh, dandy up to this point. Uh, we'll see if it can survive 90 minutes of nonstop uh, talking. We'll see if it can handle that. Secondly, um, I got some packages in the mail, and I we we uh, showed Patreon members, and I'm too superstitious. I didn't even bring a copy, but boxes of books arrived at my house today uh i literally uh collapsed into tears it was insane i uh, never thought this day would happen it reminded me of uh john mcenroe winning uh wimbledon back in the day where he would drop to his knees and uh, that was it. it was an emotional moment the book is officially in paperback at least and uh for all those who signed up at signed survivorbook.com carmen and i are getting together Thursday night, we're signing all those uh, um, inserts, which are going to go in a special hardcover copy. So thank you. I will not harp on this too long, but I will show you guys this because we've got our uh, book tour officially kicked off here. Coming to New York, May 14th, Boston, May 16th, Toronto, May 21st, Tallahassee, our OG story with Dan Markell, June 6th. Miami, July 25th. We'll be doing a few things in Miami and Los Angeles, August 15th. Hopefully, Carm will make it through all this. Um, and so uh, there you go. Um, but again, uh, what a day. It was crazy. I think I told everyone my dad wrote a book in 1971. Teared up because I would love my dad to be here to see it. But I keep telling Carm, I'm putting the book in a Ziploc bag and putting it on his uh, tombstone. She said, I'm insane. And I said, I definitely am a little bit crazy but i'm still doing it she can tell me i'm not doing it but i am doing it so there you go and uh if you want to stay informed i'll leave this up i'm going to scan this little barcode but uh on to the uh topic of the day um and i got a lot of comments because i was uh let's just say not enthused about paying my taxes which uh everyone has to do and uh i'm continuing to work on that so i got a lot of people saying they're in the same boat so i'm glad i'm not the only american uh, in the process of paying taxes, the worst time of year for uh, dealing with that stuff. But anyway, I digress again. The search, this is what is most important for two Oklahoma women, continues as investigators are now trying to piece together the events leading up to their disappearance. Uh, it is two moms who seemingly vanished into thin air. Now, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation said on Sunday that they were actually called in to investigate the quote unquote, what is being described as a suspicious disappearance of 27 year old Veronica Butler and 39 year old Jillian Kelly. Uh, they have not been seen since. Uh, so uh, this is a real uh, what happened and a who done it, as detectives like to say. And uh, Detective Phil Ramos is here. Um, arguably no better detective in all of the United States of America. He is a retired senior homicide detective. Don't tell Phil Waters I just said that, but they're comparable, I would say. Uh, he was with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, 35 years of service, the last 15 of those years in homicide, 12 years undercover in narcotics and organized crime details. Told us last time he used a friend of his father's uh, alias undercover, uh, Ray Garcia, that was his undercover name, three-time Officer of the Year Award, and he is a native of Las Vegas and loves to ride his Harley. And for the first time, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Dr. Michaela Saramosing. Did I get it? Oh, and Michaela, I'm having trouble hearing you. The COE is going to help you with that. Um, oh, talk to me. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Thank you so much, Michaela. So that is... Wait a minute. What's the town? That we're talking about in um, Oklahoma. Okay, how, do you, how do you pronounce that town? Oh, Ava? Yeah, yeah, Texas County is more, 
in like the diamond area and that area up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's way out in the pan panhandle part of Oklahoma. Yeah, and we'll get into that in a moment. But Dr. Michaela Saramosing, she is the owner of the largest Oklahoma-owned private investigation and process serving uh, company. She's a licensed process server, a private investigator, and notary public. She's also licensed as a teacher, a principal, a superintendent, and is an ardent advocate of civil rights for the oppressed. She's built up, the, as I said, the largest private investigation agency in the entire state. So a good person to have with us uh, on this occasion for sure. And then, of course, last but not least, an original Okie right there. Not from the panhandle, but... Uh, yeah, buddy, go OU! <laughs> <laughs> Boomer he, Sooner! <laughs> he's a senior therapist at the Pace Center in Greenville, South Carolina, specializing in dysfunctional relationships, uh, which we can all uh, attest to being part of in one way or another. And of course, he has worked with former inmates. So um, without further ado, let's just dive into this. The um, the two women here, and they are both moms. So this is getting um, a lot of um, media attention right now. It's 27-year-old Veronica Butler, 39-year-old Jillian Kelly. As a matter of fact, before I go any further, um, Dr. Sarah Mosing, uh, what is the uh you know the temperature of this story in oklahoma is this being discussed on the news nightly is this starting to gain steam out there it's starting to gain some uh, uh steam uh human trafficking is very big in oklahoma especially in the united states oh uh, sorry that's my cat that's uh, okay are, <laughs> oh, oh it's a very very big a uh, big hot ticket item out here um, and the disappearance of two young uh, ladies is also very concerning. Uh, we have a lot of land out in Guymon, and I was just there about a month ago um, in the courthouse. It's it's a big concern, absolutely. Okay, and feel I feel like you're a little far away from the computer, so make yourself comfortable. We're hearing you great, but uh, I don't want you to be feeling like you're straining there because uh, we usually go about an hour and fifteen minutes. Um. Bill Ramos, a detective with more experience than most. Uh, I texted you the minute we weren't planning to do this story today. As a matter of fact, we were planning to stay on Madeline Soto. Uh, but believe it or not, as far as I know, Stefan Stearns waived his arraignment. So there was no hearing. Guys, uh, cowardly on many levels. I didn't even know that that was a thing. Um, but we are going to obviously stay on that story tomorrow, by the way. We're going to get back on Sebastian Rogers, and then we will circle back eventually to Madeline Soto. But long story short, um, I was reading about this last night. I saw some media reports, and uh, what I usually do is reach out to the guys who know way more than me, and that would be Phil Ramos. And uh, Phil, uh, when you read this story, I mean, what really struck you here? Because uh, this is this is an odd one. That's very very odd, and that's what struck me the most is. Um... The fact that two middle-aged moms are on their way to pick up kids and then they never make it and then their car is found some distance from where they were last seen um it it reeks of foul play without knowing any more than we know we we don't know that they're the victims of a violent crime but it's very unlikely that there's something else you know i don't, I, I can't see two women with a 10-year age difference saying hey let's go play uh you know Thelma and Louise and something like that. Um, mm. It's clearly a uh, uh, involuntary missing person. And I, I don't know that they're able to say that there's been a crime yet, uh, but it certainly looks like it's heading that way. Mm. Uh, just one minor correction. I would, uh, the, Veronica's 27, Jillian 39. So not quite middle age, but uh, 39 yeah. is creep, creeping yeah. in there, but uh, obviously 27 is still young. Um, Back to uh, uh, Dr. Sarah Mosing on this um, from Nacho's mom, and then we'll get to uh, Raj for sure. When did they go missing? Do we have an official kind of day and time on this uh, right now? It was um, um, it was in Eva, Oklahoma. I believe it was just a couple of days ago. It hasn't been 
uh, very long whatsoever. But the fact, of, like he said, I mean, the fact that they've gone missing when they were going to go pick up their own kids is definitely reeks a foul play. I, I mean, two, two, two parents who were going to go pick up their kids wouldn't just go out, like he said, and go play a uh, Thelma and Louise type type of a, a situation. There has to be something. And my suspicion is that it's either something like human trafficking or uh, or a family member that knew where they were going to be, or perhaps just the psycho down, down the road um, who had gotten mm. them from it. So, Yeah, and Dr. Sarah Mosing, have, have you been um, solicited to help out on this investigation, uh, or do you think you will be? I haven't yet. I um, I actually just had read about it on the news about a couple of days ago. Um, <clears throat> so that was the first that I'd actually heard about it. Um, but if we're called to do so, I mean, we'll be happy to help because I'm very familiar with the area. So we'll be mm. happy to help if they ask us to. There you go. Uh, Dr. Michaela Saramosing offering her services. Uh, Ned Smith, 50 is the new middle age, Joel. So I'm above middle age. And uh, Mrs. Jim Morrison is uh, cautioning me. And Phil Ramos, watch it, Joel. Middle age, thirty-seven. LOL. Coe's getting there. Another couple years, and I think I will refer to her as uh, a middle-aged adult, but uh, not quite yet. Doctor Roger Rhodes. Whenever you're on, we have fun because uh, you're, and I mean this with all due respect and love. You're a little dysfunctional yourself for a hey, man, I'm, I'm a born and bred Okie, and you, that's you what are. I'm say. Even though I'm a South Carolinian now. You know, I, I was Ada born and grew up in Oklahoma City and been all around the state. So I, I, I understand and have been in the area. There you go. And look, uh, this is it. The two missing moms. You've got Jillian Kelly on the left, 39, Veronica Butler. We'll get into some of the details about them. You can send tips via email. I'm reading this out to those listening. Tips at osbi.ok.gov. Tips at osbi.ok.gov or call 1-800-522-8017, 1-800-522-8017. Raj, uh, since you are a born and bred Oki, uh, yeah. just give, give us a little lay of the land here. Um, this is the panhandle part of Oklahoma. What does this oh, mean? Okay. What other states uh, border here? My geography is uh, very lacking, okay. particularly in this Look, area. Think about a frying pan and the handle mm. and that they're at the handle of the frying pan and on top of the handle is kansas and at the bottom of the candle handle is texas okay and it's uh an agricultural area a lot of wheat uh, is grown up there and uh it's just i think the biggest thing when you were talking about middle age you were just trying to make a point these these aren't teenagers mm. these are these are grown adults and uh, it's it's tough. It's a tough deal because uh, something's off. That that you know, it's not like uh, we're just out here hanging out in this area of Oklahoma. This is not a hangout area of Oklahoma. So uh, the thought that there's misadventure in this issue issue. Is very high. I, I I think Phil has hit the hit the nail on the head. I think the doc is right on top of it. Yes, this smells off. Something's wrong. And uh, Dr. Roger Rhodes is a uh, a student of human behavior, so uh, you got to take that um, uh, understanding that he understands people pretty well. Uh, very very insightful when you talk to Roger Rhodes about human behavior. So. Um, Phil Ramos, to you, the search is now on, obviously, for these two moms. Um, there are very few details, so I was kind of at a little hesitation doing this, but there are enough to go on, and I'm going to deconstruct this sort of piecemeal here and obviously have you and uh, the doctor investigator kind of walk us through this. But let, let's say, Phil, um, you worked in Oklahoma and not uh, Las Vegas, and you were still working. Uh, you get called out to this very remote scene. Um we had a photo at one point. I don't think we have it pulled up. But this is a very, very rural, remote area. Um, I know they're trying to put together a timeline leading up to the disappearance. But, Phil Ramos, where would you start here? Well, obviously, you start where the car was found. And you get that car processed for evidence as, as soon as possible. 
Um, my sense of it is that's why uh, uh, SBI was brought in or the state police were brought in because of their uh, investigative abilities um, in a rural area. I, I would imagine that the uh, local cops that are handling it probably don't have the uh, ability to conduct as thorough an investigation as the state police do. So you get that car impounded, you get it to a lab and you just start processing the heck out of it. And then you start a crime scene search where the car was found. Um, and of course, license plate readers are gonna come into play. You work backwards from where the car was found to where they were last seen, look for cameras that, were, that would have been along the way. And it doesn't appear that there'd be many roads that they could have taken to end up in this place. Of course, that's, you know, we don't know the little rural roads that are paved, unpaved and stuff like that. But the most likely method that they would have gotten there, that's where you start backtracking to where they were last seen. And, you know, the priority is getting that car processed for evidence. Yeah, and uh, Detective Ramos, um, how long does it take to properly process this car? I mean, do they have a lot of information back already? Uh, they'll have basic information, but it's going to take a while, depending on the size of the car. You know, they're they're going to start with uh, the obvious uh, signs. Is, is there anything that looks amiss inside the car? Is the glove box all messed up? Or is there any signs of a struggle or will there be blood droplets somewhere? Uh, you look for the obvious things and then you just start meticulously going through every area, starting with the driver's side steering wheel and working your way out from there. So. Um, it, it, because of the nature of this case, you have to go at it with as fine tooth a comb as you can, as you can, because you don't know what's going to come into play later. And every little shred that you pick up may or may not have evidentiary value. You can't discount it. You know, if, if it's a popsicle stick or if it's a hammer with some blood on it, you have to include everything that you find in that car. Wow. Um, and this is, to me, these stories are always very fascinating. I got yelled at by Nancy Grace for saying that, but it's because Phil Ramos has it in his blood to try to figure these things out. You can see how his mind is working in real time, as does uh, Dr. Michaela Saramosing. Um, Dr. M, if I can call you that, um, do these women know each other? Uh, there was very little release, but I do know in the early news reports, uh, they were all the media outlets were saying it was it was basically unclear what the relationship is. I've seen some comments in here that there were acquaintances. Um, do you know what the connection is between the two of them, other than the fact that they were going uh, to pick up some children of one of the two women? Yeah, my understanding is that they were uh, friends or acquaintances of each other, and they were kind of taking a, a short, like a very short road trip uh, with each other to go pick up the two, uh, children. Um, I would also say that the things that the investigators are are going to want to take a look into will be checking the uh, 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 cell phone towers, any uh, cell phone uh, records of theirs, any text messages, any uh, social media, talking with witnesses, uh, uh, checking out you know, camera footage of anybody along that path. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that they have to do uh, to, to be able to try to find these individuals and even going in the like, uh, the more discreet routes of talking with informants of who are very familiar with human trafficking and the underworld and the darker side of things and that go on in an area like that. Mm. Uh, I want to get back to the human trafficking issue in a moment, but from real happy, uh, and this is why I love, I would say best guests on STS, but better, better uh, community here um, really tapped in. Uh, Jillian was going to supervise Veronica's visit with her children uh, Veronica is the younger one, Veronica Butler. Um, Dr. Raj, talk to me. Um, you know, we've seen it. You've been on shows. We've done the entire uh, Dan Markell nine plus year, almost 10 year uh, murder case revolves around a bitter, horrific custody battle. Um, this is obviously uh, we don't know the, the specifics of the relationship, but it looks like she had only a supervised visitation. Um these situations can become very volatile, can't they? Well, well, certainly. And, you know, one of the things you have to understand is it wasn't like they were going through the Grand Canyon to go get this child. This is, this is somewhat of a desolate area of Oklahoma. It's very flat. 
and very agricultural. So uh, having someone there uh, could be a good safety decision to do that. And if she was supervising, even better. Uh, but also one of the things I'm surprised that the doctor hadn't brought up is drugs in that area uh, mm -hmm. is very prevalent. So could this be drug related? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. but again, it, it, it's, it's in an odd place and uh, it's, it's not Metro at all. And so uh, this is kind of an isolated incident, an odd isolated incident which makes you immediately jump to something suspicious about it. Uh, Raj, I'd be remiss if I did not read this from Mary Biddy. Can you get Roger to do a yee-haw or a... Yee-haw, buddy. <laughs> yeah, was... buddy. Okay, L-A-H-O-M-A. -A. <laughs> buddy, that's how it's done in the big state. There you go. Yeah. yeah that's, that's the Yoki right there. Um oh, buddy. And and so and and knowing that I mean Oklahoma full of good people, good people, mm -hmm. and that area, you know, good farming people. So having two women disappear out of nowhere in a flat land, this is very strange. That this this ought to, you know, shoot a flare out there. Get yes. on get on it quick. Think uh, you know, bad behavior, you know. Right. Raj was kind of half joking, like where where could these women even be hidden or taken? And because uh, it's so flat, but Strawberry Wine, I'm not bringing up the comics. I want to get to this question. Uh, Strawberry Wine says you can literally see Amarillo from the panhandle of Oklahoma. <laughs> it is so flat out there. Yes, I live yes. in Oklahoma City. Um, yeah. It's uh, I, Joel, you have to remember in Oklahoma, one of the mainstays is you don't want to live where at night you can't see the lights of the next city. Mm. That's very important to people. You know, wow. that, that, that they, these are not, these are not living in the mountains, living in the, in the valley. No, this is the flatland people. And I guess they all know each other. They're all buddies. They all connect. Uh, so you, this is, this is something that stands out. This case stands out. I have a fear of heights. Maybe I should move there. It sounds very flat. Uh, oh, man. It, you, you, <laughs> say that and go there, Joel. Uh, you, <laughs> it'll break you of, of the idea. <laughs> My wife always wanted to go to Oklahoma since she was from South Carolina. Oh, I took her one time. She said, enough. enough. Don't, need to go, <laughs> don't need to go back that way. We fly <laughs> from now on. Because after you go an hour of flat, that's that's a lot of flat. That's a lot of flat, a lot, a lot of flat. Of um, Phil Ramos from uh, Nona Malou. Um, these are the types of questions I assume you'd be asking. So we found out or know that the older mom, Jillian Kelly, 39, and we'll get into it. Her husband is a pastor at a local church, but we don't really know anything about the younger woman's, uh, the, the father of her children or the husband for that matter. We don't, just don't know. Um, Phil, what would you be doing at this point uh, to figure out all the family dynamics between these two women? Well, you know, we go back to establishing the victimology. We talk about that a lot. And uh, one thing that I just noticed that I wasn't aware of is that uh, did she have court ordered supervised visitation? If so, um, that's certainly something that they're going to have to look into because you have to have, uh, especially when it comes to the mom, if, if, if you're court ordered supervision, while you're visiting your own kids, there's got to be something nefarious in her background in order for that to be the case. Mm, yeah, That's certainly something that you have to look at, and the cops will be doing that. Um, and like the doc said, the, the digital footprint is going to be very important as well because you got to see who they were talking to, uh, what they were doing, what their searches were, uh, how many cell phone towers did were pinged on the way out to where this car was found. Um, yeah. And the question well, about the baby know, daddy, are there? yeah, the question about the baby daddy is certainly important because yeah. going back to the supervised visitation, if uh, baby daddy's upset with her getting supervised visitation, that could come into play. If baby daddy was part of why she got supervised visitation, that could come into play. You just can't discount anything right now until you've really gone deep, deep into the background of uh, the mom and the pastor's wife. So uh, 
There's a lot of stuff that they're going to be doing, and, and they're going to be working this around the clock. Uh, Ramos, I have a million more questions for you and Dr. Ram, but what is this all about from Danielle Mallory? I love Phil Ramos, and I love him even more now that I know that he's the uncle of one of my favorite Instagram people, <laughs> not the worst mom. Who's not the worst mom? She's that's your my yeah, that's my niece, and I'm her godfather, and I love her to death. She is the oh, greatest. She, she is a stand-up comedian of all things, and really? she's just hilarious, man. She, I, I just love her. She, she, her first name is Sarah, and, and uh, she, she's a riot. She's a hoot. Yeah, uh, listen, Phil Ramos is one of the coolest cats that I have ever met, and uh, I am Coe. I haven't uh, formally told you this, but um, Doctor G explains is going with his son. I don't think I can take J Mac, but I really am thinking of going to Vegas for International Fight Week. And if I go, I'm inviting Phil Ramos to that. Um, by the way, I follow your niece on Insta. I need to know right away, Coe. How many how many followers does she have right now? I need to know. She got a bunch. <laughs> by the way, yeah. I'm not competing with not the worst mom. We should get her on the show one time, but not not oh, to compete yeah. with her. Does she yeah. live in Vegas? Yeah, she lives here in Vegas. And interestingly enough. Her little sister, her baby sister, went to uh, Oklahoma, and uh, she's married there, has a couple of beautiful little kids, and I think, I want to say they're in Enid. I'm not sure. Yeah, buddy. But, wow. I'm just, how did Danielle Malley realize that you're her uncle? That's what I don't understand. That's my um, investigative. Uh, I actually I actually told Sarah about three weeks ago that I'm uh, a, uh, often a guest on your show and, and gave her the website and she follows now. Oh, that's awesome. I'm going to follow her back. How about that? Yeah. I love it. Um, no, that's called word of mouth. Yeah. <laughs> COE, you know how my brain's work and we'll talk about, uh, <laughs> Phil's lovely. Um, so she's, is she your niece? Yeah, she's my niece. Your niece. Okay. All right. There you go. And by the way, I don't want to compete with not the worst mom, but, um, Fred and Ethel have their own Instagram account now. Fred <laughs> Ethel STS, Fred, the best Shit. best pups in true crime. Fred Ethel STS, and man, they were uh, going at. I took them to the dog park today, and uh, I bring Fred into the medium sized dog park, and Ethel protects him, and it's uh, it's wild to watch. But anyway, by the way, if I get hate mail that we're talking about dogs and uh, not the worst mom in the middle of this story. And someone is like, Joel can't stay on topic because he has ADHD. Send me the hate mail. Send it to me. I will forward it to Phil Ramos and we'll make fun of you oh. when we're at a UFC event in uh, during International Fight Week. Anyway, all right. So back to business here, though. Um, Dr. M, to you, I, obviously of note, the Oklahoma, Dr. M is like, what did I get myself into? I promise you this is a legit show, Dr. M. Uh, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, uh, the OSBI, is now involved. What does it take for them to be brought in? Why are they involved? Yeah, well, the OSBI, any time that like the smaller law enforcement agencies don't feel equipped to be able to handle a case, um, maybe it's a big murder or a big kidnapping with a lot of notoriety, uh, something like this, that's when they say, hey, look, we don't have the resources, the manpower, the experience, the time, the money, whatever, mm -hmm. to handle this. Could you please help us? Now, from my personal experience, the OSBI tends to be a little bit overrated <laughs> in their ability to, to help. And I speak from experience on, on working a lot of uh, different murders and cases like that. Um, but I think these individuals are probably hidden in plain sight um, or they're not very far away from where they disappeared. That's my thought. I mean, um, it could be human trafficking and they could be overseas by now. But I just from experience, I think they're probably not that far, whether alive or dead or otherwise. I don't think they're super far away is my guess. But. Mm. And I'm, I'm taking notes because you're saying some interesting things I want to circle back to. Uh, Phil Ramos, to you, given how remote, by the way, La Mesa uh, says that if anything ever happens to her, she wants Phil Ramos on the case. Uh, God forbid that happens, La Mesa. But if it does, Phil will be the first person I call. Um, I'll be there. Yep. Given how remote the uh, docs are saying that this location is, and you just heard 
Um, Roger Rhodes explained it as a handle on a pan, literally. I'd imagine there aren't many yeah, visitors. Wait, look at the map. I'm not making that up. That's <laughs> what I was taught in high school. Exactly. Uh, right. Panhandle, we up. Wait, no, wait a minute. If you go to school in Oklahoma, isn't that what they say? Pan, panhandle, you have to pan. panhandle because it is a handle of a pan. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course. Right. No, that makes sense. That makes sense, Roger. Right. That does make sense. But... Nowhere, Bill. Nah, yeah. I no way it is. But mm. that's why I love Phil in this. And I thought, boy, it's very powerful. The first thing I would do after checking out the car, mm. the second thing I'd do is checking out the family. Yep. Yeah. Because I'm telling yep. you, family is a big deal in that area. And yep. who knows who? is a big deal and people you know they get off course and and they tell somebody and all of a sudden they blow it up and things get bad quick yeah, yeah. well raj this is the question i was just going to get to from the yeah. philadelphia shoulder surgeon friend of the show yeah. she uh is asking and i'm asking you this question if you your gut, what does your gut instinct here tell you? Um, and I know you're not supposed to go off gut instincts, Roger. Right. You're a you're a therapist, so you can do this. Um, are, do you feel that this is someone who is known to them because of kind of what we've been talking about? That this is an area where uh, everyone is connected in one way or another, right. or do you think that this is um, totally random? If you had to go with your gut, the I, if I'm, I'm going with my gut, first thing I'm saying is. Check the family, okay? But with drugs, with human trafficking, with being in the middle of nowhere, uh, can can weird people be around good people? Yeah. And could this be the case? But, man, I wouldn't even go to there until I made sure I checked every family member and every friend of every family member and what the dynamics were. Have these women ever interacted in a negative way with somebody in the area, you know, and and it, is it possible that some, you know, offhand moment can turn real bad in an area like that? And the area, and the answer is you bet. It can turn bad quick, and that you know, there's a whole lot of nothing to do a whole lot of bad in in that area. Um, Phil Ramos is time the enemy in a case like this. As time passes. Uh, do you feel like the chances of a good outcome are minimized? Yes. Well, you know, it, it's sad to say no. And, and that time is rapidly approaching. Um, if it's not already here, uh, yeah, time is not your friend in cases like this. You, you need to get on it as soon as you can with everything that you got and throw everything at this investigation. Um, you know, you know, going back to the location where the car was found, um, if it's as remote and desolate as uh, everybody's saying, then canvassing that neighborhood is going to, well, call it, like canvassing the area, I shouldn't call it a neighborhood, is going to be important too because they're going to know somebody's sitting up at, uh, you know, three or four o'clock in the morning and a strange car goes by. Yes, they know everybody yes. that belongs there. And yeah. if say, some guy in a, you know, in a black Camaro goes by, they're going to say, whoa, 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 who the hell was that? And that's unless, just unless it's it's a it's somebody who has a history, Phil, a hanging in a bar. You know, they yeah. have a lot of you know, yeah. little bar somewhere. Could it be somebody? That's where I like your idea of checking between where they're going, where they are in the cameras. Because could somebody pick up from a little bar? And go, yeah. Ooh. So that that's a piece too, but yeah, look at the area, look at the families. By the way, Coe, I did text you earlier today. Uh, contrary to popular belief, as I always say, I do uh, study up on these cases. So, Coe, I sent you a picture of the actual road, um, which is incredibly desolate. If you can pop that up, that would yeah. be a great help. But uh, sweet and salty wants to know, Doctor M, if there is uh, snow on the ground right now in this part of Oklahoma. Um, can you tell us if that's the case, Dr. M? Well, there isn't at the moment. Um, my wife and I live out in Hitchcock, which is about 15 minutes south of Watonga. And we had snow last week, just a little bit for the morning, but there's not any snow at the moment. Now, 
it's Oklahoma, but that could change any day. But I think somebody has to know something up there about what's going on. It's too small of a place for someone not not to know. And the detective's right, and the other doctor's right. I mean, there's that's even like what I said in my email to you guys. It, it's most likely the the family or somebody that that knows them is most unlikely. And I'm definitely inclined to agree with them both on it. Yeah. yeah uh, doc, Dr. Have- M, I just want to say, uh, number one, we love having you on. And number two, I always feel funny because uh, sometimes we forget to tell people. So um, we're probably going to go like another 45 minutes and obviously we'd love to have you. And if you have to run, uh, no hard feelings at all. But uh, one thing I do want to circle back to you on um, from Jody Johnson has this question. I heard today in another case that prostitution is now called human trafficking. Is that true? But larger uh, in terms of a, a larger scope related to this, just sort of what what are the parameters? What is human trafficking considered to be and why is it problematic in this part of Oklahoma? <laughs> yeah. Are you asking? Me yeah, yeah, Dr. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well, what sure. yeah, it's very need to say is Mexicans and Indians, it's just down from Texas, man. Yeah, well, we have, and it's desolate. Yeah, yeah, and we have like uh, the highways going straight through Oklahoma from from the border to uh, Mexico and to te- Texas, and and we're kind of like in the middle where they can go anywhere. And I'm I'm experienced in human trafficking, and yeah, it's a huge problem. The United States is the biggest perpetrator of human trafficking, even though we don't have the highest population per per se, per per capita that we do it all the time. I mean, a, a labor, uh, forced uh, sexual acts, I mean, everything. And it's, it's, it's right in plain sight a lot of times. I mean, whether it's ignored or you just don't see it or you don't know how to recognize it, it's all over the place. And I think that's a possibility. Um, if it's not the family, especially, or even if it is the family, because human trafficking can be fa- a, a, a family members too. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of possibilities here. Mm. Uh, Phil Ramos, uh, EMA, Endangered Missing Advisory. This is something that the Oklahoma Bureau uh, of Investigation put out. Obviously, you see this. Um, Phil Ramos, you know, we see these flyers all the time um, from every agency imaginable. Are, are they still a good tool do you think i mean are these things that actually work because no matter what the story is no matter what the jurisdiction is they're always putting out these uh you know missing or wanted or looking for posters do these things actually work i'm just curious you know there was a period of time when i said that that has probably that would probably not be the biggest priority but now we've got the internet and millions and millions of people are going to see these. So yeah, they do work and they are very effective um, because, you know, with, with the dawn of uh, the internet and national broadcasts, these have come back into the forefront of, of one of your investigative techniques and tools that you use. So um, I like the way that's formatted. I like the fact that it's highlighted in yellow because if it was just plain old black and white and, and said, help, have you seen me and stuff like that, like they did in the old days, this, this catches your eye and, and you're going to take a look at it and go, Oh, whoa, wait a minute. What, what's going on here? Instead of just, you know, throwing away another milk carton face. Yeah. And Phil, what about the fact that it's two women, two moms at the same time? I mean, we always hear sadly of a missing mom, a missing woman, but what about two at the same time? Just it's so unique and so unusual. However, the fact that they were in the same car going to the same place um, doesn't mean it wasn't planned. It just means that they both happened to be possibly in the wrong place at the wrong time. I, I don't think that they were individually targeted. I think the vehicle and the two people were targeted themselves. Um, the fact that they were together is, man, so it's just really, really unusual. Really, yeah, I mean, I mean, Phil, in your career, do you I mean, and you did this for a very long time in a wild place, which is Las Vegas. I mean, yeah. do you recall two women disappearing? I mean, how, how often could you say that that happened? I, I don't recall it ever happening here. That's not to say that it didn't. But in the situations where there were two, two women present. Um, there had to be more than one bad guy, because if there's just one bad guy, the friend is going to start 
whooping on the guy that's trying to attack one of them. So hopefully uh, that would be the case. There's going to be some uh, physical and DNA evidence as a result of that. But with two women disappearing like that, uh, I'm sure there was more than one suspect involved in this and, may, and maybe even more than one vehicle, suspect vehicle involved in this. Um, and there it is. There is the uh, missing poster. By the way, I am not T-Pain until CrimeCon and you guys meet me, meaning the COE, myself, and uh, who knows who else. Then Phil is the coolest person for sure. By the way, um, if you guys are planning to go to CrimeCon, they just gave us a code, which is shockingly STS. That is the code. And you get a discount of some sort uh, if you go to CrimeCon. So uh, use the code STS. Now, from Dilly Pickles, I love the name. Uh, the ex-husband is in treatment, um, and this is for Dr. M here, is in treatment, confirmed. His mother has custody of the kids at the time, and they were to meet three miles from where the vehicle was found. So uh, he's in, in some sort of drug rehab. Does that raise an antenna for you or your antennae, Dr. M? Well, absolutely. And like Dr. Phil, you know, said, like any time there's, I mean, if there's an issue of drugs, which which that area is very well known for, or uh, family members with questionable backgrounds who are involved in drugs or who have drug problems, it it's definitely something that uh, merits a good and meticulous look, both on the macro and micro levels. And I think that investigating the family and investigating the the community um, as a whole uh, should hopefully turn up some results here in a bit. Mm. Uh, from Dilly Pickles, just popped in. I'm in the neighboring county in the Oklahoma panhandle. I know the families of these ladies and family attends church together. This is horrible. It is horrific. Um, Dilly Pickles, please send our uh, you know, best wishes that they are found safe and sound. Uh, Kim DeLorme, what is happening? There are two missing moms in Oklahoma that uh, appear to have vanished. You're looking at their faces. Veronica Butler, 27 who is going to have a uh, visitation with her children. And we're finding out that her baby daddy uh, is in some sort of drug rehab. And then the woman on the right, Jillian Kelly was accompanying her for that visitation. Uh, details surrounding this case are uh, very, very meager, not a ton of details, but uh, that pretty much brings you up to date. Uh, let me show you now. This is the road that I asked the yeah. COE to bring up. Uh, Raj, does this oh, bring back? Buddy. What do you thank do here? You, thank you for putting that up. Yeah. There it is. There it is. Raj, what do you do here on a Friday night? Raj? Ooh, buddy. Lots of stuff we can't talk on, about on the internet. I'll tell you that right now. A mm. lot of hooping and hollering. But let me tell you, 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 you have now involved drug culture. And in an this picture tells everything. Lord, he, a whole lot of nothing. How easy would it be for someone who had less than pure motives to identify two women driving down this road and connect with them? Man, that that would be nothing. That would be nothing. It'd be so easy to do. And nobody around. Look, that's it'd be odd to have anybody notice that. Yeah, that's how that's how scary this could be. And yeah, it's odd for the internet because look how you know desolate it is. People around there wouldn't know, but the internet allows people to then all be connected, even though they're in a desolate place. Raj, what, what, do, what do you do if you're on this corner right here and there's a tornado? Do you just start running? What do you do? There's nowhere to even go. You just lay down. You. Lay down. All right. Yeah, find a ditch. I always ask the COE, what do I do in an earthquake? She grew up in LA, so she's always like, you know, get under a table. But just let me get through some of the details here because I haven't even touched a lot of what we do know. Um, so Dr. M and, and Phil Ramos, they found the, the mom's cars abandoned south of Elkhart, Kansas. That's this map. And it was about, <laughs> excuse me, three miles short of where they were headed. Uh, this was actually the younger mom who was going on the visitation. It was her car. And it was found abandoned. And this is basically the exact spot or close to where that car was uh, found abandoned. Now, the condition, Phil, back to your original uh, point of investigation, the condition of the car 
is really unknown. There's no details about what was found inside of it. Uh, if there were, you know, any fingerprints from potential suspects, even the whereabouts of her children at this point, as far as we know, are unknown. According to KVIA TV, KVIA TV, um, they were supposed to pick up Veronica Butler's six-year-old daughter and eight-year-old son in Eva, Oklahoma, and they were going to celebrate a girl's, uh, one of the, the girls, I should say, the six-year-old daughter's birthday. Now, Phil Ramos, this just immediately makes me think of Maddie Soto here uh, for a different reason, but she was celebrating a 13th birthday when she was murdered. Birthdays can be triggers for families, um, I think, Phil Ramos. So again, um, this woman, Veronica Butler, is going to pick up her six and eight-year-old child. The six-year-old daughter has a birthday. They stopped three miles short of their destination. I mean, what what do you do with that with that bit of information? Do you now go to the family um, and say, hey, were there problems? Uh, what was the deal with this birthday party? Um, you need to find where these kids are too, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's one of the very first things you do. I would wonder um, if the car was found pointing in the direction where they were supposed to be headed or if it was pulled off to the side of the road and not uh, relative to where they were supposed to be going. Um, that 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 could be something that come into play. And, and man, just as we're going along this, it just stinks even more. You know, the, mm. the drug history, the supervised visitation, the desolate nature of that. And if I'm not mistaken, th all this happened during the daylight hours, right? Yes, as far as I know. Uh, yeah, as far as I know. Dr. Rem, do we know, did this all go down during during daylight hours? That's my understanding of it was that, yes, it was during the daytime hours. Um, it, it would, for, for two women to have their car abandoned in the middle <clears throat> of a desolate area, I mean, I can't imagine if my wife and I were driving and if I didn't know the person that that I wouldn't just stop or pull over unless the car was just riddled with bullets or something. I mean, I just can't imagine myself stopping or pulling over if somebody wanted me to do so that I didn't know in an area like that. You know, I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's possible that it was a, a, a stranger, but, but I mean, to, to stop for two, two women in an area like that, I mean, you would almost have to know them, I would think. But Well, here's the thing you want to put in there. These are both religious women in in out, out out in Oklahoma. If they felt someone was in need, would they stop based on their faith? And the answer is a million times yes. Right. That would that would be a religious Oklahoman would not even think they would they would not process risk. They would think I want to you know do the the kind right thing. That that's yeah. a very interesting point because, uh, and I love what's the cat's name, Doctor M. <laughs> that's Moo. Uh, yeah, Moo. She's we're rich. we're yeah. cats. we're a dog and cat friendly show here. So yes, if we don't we see are. a cat or a dog, we go into withdrawal. So there you go. <laughs> um, well, they will warrant. By the way, um, Dilly Pickles. I love the name, but uh, the email surviving the survivor at gmail dot com. Surviving the survivor at gmail dot com. And uh, if you know any family or friends that would like to raise awareness, we're going to stay on this story. Please have them contact us at that email, surviving the survivor at gmail.com. It looks like they could use uh, the help, sadly, at this point. Uh, Will Warren, while they made it that close and being two people, they would be more likely to accept a ride than if alone. I don't want to speculate and I don't know if the uh, car was running, et cetera. But, Raj, what about the psychology of feeling a little bit safer? knowing that you're with a, you know, not a friend, but someone that you're traveling with, uh, would that give them a little more courage? Let's say if the car did break down to get in another vehicle together, um, what well, are your thoughts? You know, imagine it, we're in the country and let's say your car stalls or it, somebody looks like they need help. Okay. So they wouldn't be wearing a t-shirt saying, uh, I'm psychopathic and I'll kill you. Uh, they're going to look like regular people. You know, they're going to look like people in the area. And especially if I have a drug and alcohol background, 
Ooh, we buddy, who do those people look like like everybody else? So is it possible that they could have stopped close in the idea of helping good old farm people, trying to help other good old farm people, and it was a setup to either by family members or that you just had evil people with evil intent. So it could be either one of those easily. Dr. M, you want to follow up on that? I agree with them. I mean, I, I think that's a very big possibility and it could have been set up by the family. It could have just been an evil person down the road. I mean, that you don't know for sure, but I think that's very, uh, that that's a very interesting aspect and a way to look at it. But I think that's a totally feasible uh, a, a, a situation where they could have said, Hey, I mean, I want to stop and help somebody and boom. And that's when, because otherwise, I just, I'm not sure that I see two, two, two women, unless maybe it was just, I mean, out of a, uh, uh, from a space of trying to help, um, an altruistic reason to try to help some, somebody else in need. I don't, I don't see them just wanting to stop and talk to a lot of people. Yeah. Otherwise, I mean, I know it's a friendly no, small town no. place, but it's, yeah, uh, no. it's, it's not that, that they're not in the mood to shoot the bull. Uh, if they stop, they stop to help. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, right. Someone, people are asking if the kids were in the car, uh, the way we understand it. And again, details are very sketchy, but the kids were not with them as Heather, uh, is saying here that they were actually on the way to a visitation, uh, with those children. Um, we're looking at photos of Jillian Kelly. Now she is the one who is married to a pastor at a local church, Veronica Butler on the right is the younger of the two at 27. She's the one whose six-year-old daughter was uh, about to have a birthday. Uh, there are some descriptors for them. Veronica on the right has a several tattoos, including a Chinese symbol on her left forearm and a sunflower on her left shoulder. So a Chinese symbol on her left forearm, sunflower on her left shoulder. She's five foot four, red hair, uh, green eyes, as you can see there. And she was last seen, seen wearing a blue short sleeve shirt, denim shorts, and hey dude shoes, which I've never heard of. But um, hey, Bill Ramos. Dude. Uh, I took Ramos for you, man. Yeah. yeah. You know, hey, dude, those are shoes. That's what... Yeah. <laughs> but Phil Ramos, this strikes me. I'm in Miami, but I wouldn't expect her to be in denim shorts in early, early April. Isn't it cold there, Dr. M, right now? But see, that's the thing. I mean, Oklahoma, I mean, it was cold today, but like like yesterday or the day before, it was hot. Like, you never know. It's it's a very bipolar state, and the weather is just as bi bipolar as our population. <laughs> so, yeah. yep. Uh, Phil, people were asking, what about um, satellite surveillance? This is maybe a good place to try to use it because it is so incredibly flat, um, and by the way, on satellite surveillance, Phil, can you go back in time like a convenience store and go back and look what happened moments before? Is that possible? Is that the dumbest it, it, question you've ever gotten? <laughs> no, not the dumbest. <laughs> it's it's um, extremely difficult to, to try and access uh, satellite surveillance systems, number one, because the satellites that would have the capability of getting anything identifying uh, from that situation or that car are generally military grade satellites and, and they don't give that stuff up to anybody unless it's terrorist related or something like that. Mm. Um, it, it, it's a very, very remote possibility and very unlikely to occur. Uh, the, the, the best thing they got going for them is the, uh, GPS features on their phone. We don't know what how new the car was. Sometimes cars have GPS features that people don't know about, and they can access those. So that that's going to be the best shot. We're trying to locate uh, the travel path, and uh, so with, with th there's been very little commentary on cell phone usage by both of these women. So were they calling? Were they checking in? Hey. Um, you know, five minutes out or, hey, I'm 20 minutes out, we'll be right there. So the first place that they're going to go besides the car is to where they were supposed to be and find out what was the plan for them getting here. Did you know that this was a supervised visitation? Did you know that 
uh, Veronica was being accompanied by a supervisor, by Jillian, and just pick the brains of people on both ends to try and make some kind of sense out of this. And Phil Ramos, um, I think it was uh, Dakota saying it in the chat that her, her gut is telling her that it was a trucker uh, who maybe abducted them. Just let's go with that for one moment. This is not, we're not saying this is what happened, but hypothetically, um, if a trucker has them and he's on the go, how much does this complicate the situation? Because he could be a thousand miles away now, two thousand miles away. If if that's the case, uh, yeah, he could be anywhere. Um, anybody could be anywhere. Whoever took them could be anywhere. Um, I think it's very unlikely that a uh, cross country truck driver is involved in this because of the nature of where they were. I mean, uh, and, and the doc and Roger will be able to speak more uh, accurately to this. But it doesn't strike me as where the car is is a very heavily traffic route by uh, truck drivers. So. Mm. Uh, Dr. Rem from Tara Ellis. Great questions tonight from STS Nation. Best guess, better community. There's a reason I say it. Are the stats lower for older women? This has come up a bit in the chat here to be traffic compared to younger ones. I would assume the answer to that is yes. Um, but if they were if they were being trafficked, what would be the thinking that they're going to turn these women into grab them and turn them into prostitutes? I and mean, what's the thinking behind this? Well, it depends on what they were tra uh, trafficked for. I mean, yes, like a lot of women who are tra uh, uh, trafficked are trafficked for sex. Now you can also be trafficked for work or or, or, or as a wife or uh, something like I mean, that effect. But yes, it, it's often like the younger uh, girls and women who are tra uh, uh, trafficked um, because they can typically, the uh, traffickers can typically uh, get more clients and more money mm -hmm. than somebody who's 80 years old, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I mean, that's, that's totally uh, reasonable within it. But I mean, uh, uh, if that did happen, I mean, th there are so many places from Oklahoma, you could go from that part of Oklahoma, you could go right into Texas, Colorado, uh, Kansas, I mean, just all over the place in a heartbeat. So if that were the case, I mean, then yeah, like, like Detective Ramro said, I mean, they could be anywhere at the moment. Uh, Dr. Von Decay says, I made it. I was listening to the Daybell trial, trying to catch up. Just so you know, we are streaming that trial. Chad Daybell, gavel to gavel on our best trials channel. Uh, the COE can put that up and a shout out to, uh, Pie whack it, Peggy. I like that. Uh, who's become a new um, YouTube member? So we were talking about Veronica Butler. Well, Jillian Kelly on the left, thirty-nine years old. She is a mom of four. She volunteers extensively, uh, especially at the Hugoton First Christian Church. Uh, she runs children's programs there. You heard Dr. Raj talking about these are, um, you know, real deep believers in, in God and in the church. And, and these women certainly are, uh, her husband is a minister at a place called Willow Christian church in Indianola, Nebraska. And, um, there's a quote from a member of the church that says, please, please be in prayer for these women. Uh, this is a Facebook post, uh, from the church. Jillian is the wife of our new minister, Heath Kelly and the sister-in-law of church member Hillary Kennedy. Please pray that Jillian and her friend Veronica are safe and they are found quickly. God, please bring these women home to their families that are so worried about them. Roger, something actually kind of beautiful about this. Um, to be honest, I wish I had this sort of deep faith. Uh, well, I work on it, you know, but um, this is a part of the country, like you're saying, where, I mean, the faith is is second to none. I mean, these are true believers yeah, um, Joe, let go, go back if, for people listening, go back to 1950, 55, and think about how people were. Good old people, down to the earth people. That's what you're going to find. And it is, is it an isolated area? Yes. Is all of Oklahoma like that? Now, man, Oklahoma is full of all kinds of places. Oklahoma City, Tulsa, you know, Ardmore. There are lots of great places in Oklahoma. But in this area and the, the terrain 
And uh, is it odd for Jillian, who is a pastor's wife, to ride and help out someone? No, that would just be so common in that area as good a good Christian person helping out. That's yeah, and, Ro and, and Raj, just to kind of tack on to that, to couple it, uh, and you sort of talked about this earlier, but it would be hard, I imagine, for these people to in a way, understand the possible uh, evil that exists out there, right? Because they're coming from a different mindset. Right. Well, it's, it, yeah. And and so that's why I brought up the bar, the drugs, the connection of family. That exists out there. You know, it's a little different than it would be in a, a, a city area. This is, this is not a city culture. Right. People who are city-fied aren't drawn to this kind of area, you know, down to earth, know your neighbor, keep your door unlocked, say, know who your neighbors are is where that, what this is about. And that's why following up on this, like has, has been said and knowing all the people involved quickly is the best chance these two ladies have. Uh, Nacho's mom here, how far away were her kids? So, they stopped about three miles short of their destination. The COE was telling me they drove for about 45 miles, but they were about three miles short uh, and they were going to see the kids. So I'm not, it's, it's a little unclear exactly. Uh, Dr. M, do we know where the kids were staying at this point? Do you have any idea? I'm not sure. I would imagine probably with family or an intermediary who would, who would be able to help them to uh, get access to the kids, but I'm not clear on that at this point now. Uh, Jersey Jen in the house from the great state, my home state, where there is no panhandle. There's, <laughs> that. there's a lot of oil refineries. And yeah, they're, they're, they're working hard to find good people there too, Joe. Um, you will not find, actually in South Jersey, you will find some farmland, but nothing like this. Um, and I worked in Tucson. That's where I met the uh, notorious COE in Tucson. <laughs> Yeah, it's a funny story, which I will tell in four seconds. When I when I first got the job in Tucson, I thought it was going to be like a one, like a little main street town in like in like southwest in the southwest United States. It's like 250 square mile city takes like three hours to drive across Tucson. But a lot of the times it's desert. But you're looking at things like this where it just goes on as far as the eye can see. Ned Smith. Uh, this is not going to make the people, the Oklahomans very happy, but she says it looks like that's Mars. True. But, uh, <laughs> that's, true. that's not true, though. Yeah, that's yeah. not true. Yeah. yeah, well, wait a minute. For people there, it looks and smells like home. Oh, yeah. I go. guarantee that's it, man. Exactly right. Yeah, I think but, uh, I, I might like uh, this area of Oklahoma, um, Raj. I might have to go house hunting out there and uh, yeah. maybe it's, move the family. Good people, good people. But hey, Joel, I'll tell you this. Mm -hmm. The best therapy I was ever involved with in my career was in Tucson, Arizona. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, like man, Some good, good uh, uh, drug and alcohol work that getting done in Tucson right now. It, there's a big need for it. The desert, the desert breeds a weird type of people. I'll say that is my buddy. <laughs> My bet, my best friend is uh, one of my best friends. One of my closest friends is the chief meteorologist at KVO. Bless you at KVOA in Tucson, Arizona. Imagine doing the weather where it's sunny 363 days a year, but that's what he does. Uh, Cat's Attic says, "Living in Singapore, I cannot start to imagine driving in such a deserted, dry place. Uh, snakes probably love it. Scorpions, all these creatures, at least in the desert. Uh, there was never a night. I know some people will find this hard to believe in Tucson." where I did not get out a black light and look for scorpions under my covers because wow. they scared the crap out of me. And uh, then when you walk your dog, I used to walk Mabel Rose and uh, you got wild pigs called javelinas. Just <laughs> Phil Ramos knows about this. He's in a, he's in a similar desert. Um, Phil Ramos, back to you on this. You've been in this situation many times where you're a lead investigator and you know what information to release and what information to not release uh what would you not give away in this situation because the details are very scant yeah um critical information that if the bad guy knows you have it is going to make him disappear um, 
and you know some some give me an example give me an example well if someone had seen a car meet with them or saw them in another car and they say yeah i i saw those two ladies and they were in you know a red f-150 in the back and they look scared you're not going to release that until you're able to follow up on that because if that's true and if it's accurate the bad guys hear you say that they're even going to get farther away and they're going to modify that truck so it's not the one that you're looking for so uh, things like that uh, sensitive information Certainly uh, deep, dark secrets that the family has told you, which hopefully if there are any, they'll tell the cops because that could come into play. Um, lifestyles of, uh, at this point, the young mom, um, different things like that that you don't want to bring unnecessary stress to the family. They're going through it enough as it is right now. So, But by the same token, we have uh, two women who you know, I, I hate to keep saying this, but they are very likely in danger and you have to give out as much information as you can without compromising the investigation with the information that you've come up with. And you walk a very fine line in cases like this and you hope against hope that they're alive somewhere and being held captive for whatever reason. Um, but uh, uh, you hope for the best, but expect the worst. And in a, on a show like this, I would ask STS Nation uh, to please share and retweet the, the YouTube link because the more eyeballs on this, the, the better the chances are that someone will see something uh, and say something. Uh, Aria Dakota Grimaldi Lane, one of the coolest names uh, in all of STS. Uh, so there were no signs of a struggle in or around the car and was nothing left behind in the car. I think the short answer is we just don't know. And Phil was just saying that if there was a struggle and someone saw that, that's the kind of thing he would not release. Um, I saw this comment. Um, since Phil Ramos is a retired homicide detective and a grandfather and the uncle of, what is it, not the worst mom, um, what would you say to this person, Phil Ramos? I stopped one time because a stranger offered me a free dog. Um, what do you, Phil, um, how careful, especially to the women, uh, need to be when offers like that come around from um, random men out there? You know, women have such a keen sense of what's going on around them. I have found that women are much more able to smell something wrong than, than men are. And go with your instincts. Go with what your gut tells you. Um, but don't fall for the help me find my lost puppy. He's in this back alley thing. Just, mm -hmm. just don't do it. Just don't do it. Um, yeah. Trust your instincts and, and keep going no matter what you're being offered or no matter what sob story someone tells you. Just just don't do it. Uh, Dr. M, um, are there oil wells? Obviously, they uh, dig for oil out here. Are there oil wells in the area? Would that be a place that these uh, women could be hidden or taken to potentially? And it's possible that that area, uh, uh, Texas County, I know because I've got under 60 acres and got, <laughs> doesn't have a lot of oil and minerals compared to other parts of the state. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it's possible. I mean, there are some, but it's not as as much as you would have in other locations. Uh, Dr. M, let me ask you a question. Uh, do you think I could get a house for less money here on this road than I could in Miami? Uh, what's, what's this? <laughs> Yes, I got so. I was, so let me just give you like an example. Two two years ago, we bought 160 acres with mineral rights for 104 thousand dollars. Now that's gone up. Yeah, now that's gone up. So now it's worth probably 150 thousand because of the inflation that we had. But even just two years ago, you you, you could get 160 acres for that little money. I mean, that's a pretty good amount, but you're also way out in the boondocks, too. Well, so, I mean, if you try to get that in Deer Creek or Edmond or something like that, I mean, you'd be paying quite a bit of coin. And and what do you, I, I don't want to get nosy here. I'm curious. What do you do with that land? Is that something that you plan to build on or it's an, an investment? Once uh, you go off track again. I have it enrolled in the CRP pro program. Oh, we're actually looking to sell it because of uh, something that the previous sellers did that was not good. but. Um, but we're going to buy it elsewhere, like out of the county, like anyway. But, um, but 
the uh, government will pay you money if you don't farm it. And then you can just get the money like about like $4,500 a year for the next 10 years on land like that. So you get the investment, plus you get the increase in the value of the land. The, the uh, taxes are almost nothing. And then you get the CRP payment every year. I mean, it's a win-win uh, a, a situation for it. So. Hmm. Uh, COE, let the kids know we're packing up. Let Fred and Ethel, we're moving out west uh, to Oklahoma. Uh, I like this area. You don't get bothered. There's no Ferraris every single day being flashed in my face. Uh, we're making the move. Uh, I'm, I'm down for it. Someone's telling me that yesterday it was 80 degrees in this area. Today it's 55. Uh, it was 80 on Saturday. So a uh, schizophrenic temperature out there. And then Annie K, are their families speaking out? Uh, we'll meet you there. Wink, wink, your fam. Uh, now you'll be coming with me. Um, I'll even get a uh, uh, like a camper. We'll go in a camper. Uh, it'll be <laughs> fun. It'll be a fun. We'll tell the kids it's just for a few days, and then I'll let them loose when they're eighteen. Um, the, Wait a the, minute, Joel, Joel. One thing you need to I would need to say about this picture. Yes, sir. Nothing's growing. Okay, this, <laughs> and and to think that that's always the way it is, man. That that could be a wheat field, and you know, in in after planting season, you could just have miles of waving wheat there to be uh, harvested. So mm -hmm. that that's part of that area too. Uh, uh, er Erica here, by the way, is asking how long they've been missing, and I think it's uh, late Saturday to Sunday is really the last time anyone. Um, you know, has seen them. And, th and this is good from Dr. Von de Kay. I will tell Doug McGregor about this. He is the geo profiler. He uses all kinds of calculations and software uh, to geographically profile people uh, like this. Again, how long was their drive? I think it was about a 45 mile to 50 mile drive, possibly 60, but they stopped short by about three miles. Now, um, someone asked if the family speaking out, um, Veronica Butler's aunt, her name is Melissa Dean Padilla. And I actually, for full disclosure, reached out to her today. Uh, her quote is, this is my niece. We've been on the scene all day. It is unknown why her car was abandoned where it was by Yarborough. Uh, Butler's aunt, Melissa Dean Padilla, wrote on social media. This was on a Facebook post, I believe. My family appreciates all who have helped and pray that they are brought home uh safely phil ramos to you and then we'll slowly begin to wrap this up but you know you're obviously super good at what you do and you did it for a really long time and you're very cool calm and collected but i, I know you're a type a underneath that and how do you when you're just starting an investigation like this you know whether it's here or in vegas this has got to be like you know clawing away at you constantly how do you how do you sort of um keep things in order stay calm and stay focused how do you do that because you obviously want the answer and time is your enemy here yeah um well you base that off of the information that you're getting um in your investigation talking to the family members the you know cell phone data whatever is coming across your desk, you've got many, many places to go, many different directions until you start narrowing things down. So that keeps your mind busy, keeps you, you know, you're trying to think of everything that could possibly happen and you try to eliminate the things that are very unlikely to have happened. So you, you keep your focus on what evidence you have right in front of you and where that evidence is taking you. And, um, you know, sometimes you got to keep the horses in check and sometimes you just got to let them run. It all depends on what you're working on. Uh, do we know if there was personal property in the car, phones, purses? We do not know. Uh, again, Phil Ramos, if their cell phones are left behind, that's something that possibly only the abductor would know. So is that something you would not release? Yes, I wouldn't release that at all because if their cell phones are left in that car, their purses are left in the car, it's a horrible sign, man. That's that's nothing but trouble right there. Mm -hmm. um, if their personal items are with them, it gives you a little ray of hope. But if their personal items are in that car, nothing good is going to happen. Wow. Uh, that is uh, a homicide detective with many years experience. Oh, man, we just lost Dr. M at a critical moment, but that's all good. Uh, she 
was here today and I'll, I'll, I'll give her her. Uh, oh, she's back. Dr. M is back. Okay. I thought, I thought we lost you at the very end there, but uh, I am wrapping up now. Dr. Roger Rhodes. He is a senior therapist at the Pace Center in Greenville, South Carolina. The guy studies human behavior and people for a living. And uh, he is insisting that I do move my family uh, to this corner of Oklahoma. Uh, I, I do want the, the this case to be solved before I'm up and move there. I'm going to build a house right to the right of that power uh, pole right there. There's plenty of room for the kids, Fred and Ethel, to run around. And uh, I don't know. It'll be a good time. It'll be a, hey, a change Joel, of the, yes. the doctor here has plenty of acreage. Well, she's about to sell. She's about to sell. But um, there you go. There you go. Uh, we don't need a lot of acreage. Um, so uh, you know, we'll we'll make do with what we have. But Dr. Roger Rose, you, you know, you are this is uh not this particular area, but Oklahoma is your native land. Oh, buddy. Um land. what what are you thinking at this hour about what could have happened to these two mothers and your final thoughts? If you don't think every piece of uh available police I could put in a bar in that area, you'd be wrong. Uh, I would be looking for gossip. Gossip about, you know, because evil people have a hard time keeping their mouth shut. And uh, out, in the out in the country, evil people even have a harder time of keeping their mouth shut, especially if they're sitting drinking. So I would have a, a police presence uh, undercover in bars, listening to see uh, if I could hear uh, any pulse of, of anybody knowing anything. Mm. Uh, that Frank, would be the only one thing like, I could do. Uh, she left you out on this list, uh, Raj. Garth Brooks and Blake Shelton are from Oklahoma, as is Dr. Phil, but the real doc, Dr. Roger Rhodes, is from there, too. Oh, wait uh, a minute. Wait a minute. Let, me, let me say something. Please do. Blake Shelton is from Ada, Oklahoma. I was born in Ada, Oklahoma. Mm. I lived in Ada the same time Blake Shelton lived in Ada. Mm. So I, I may not be mentioned, but but I'm in the same area at the same time. There you go. There you go. And, oh, oh, here's the other one. My former sister-in-law's house, uh, uh, she was in real estate. The first house she sold was to Garth Brooks. Really? Yeah. That's, See, that's I wild. mean, people know people. We we all people. We all connect. We're, we're learning. We're all connected. We're one. Yeah. We're one happy family. This human race. Um, Laura V says the ex husband was released from. Here we go, Phil, from prison the day before. They've been embroiled in a five year yeah. custody uh. dispute. Phil Ramos, uh, what does that do to the uh, course of the investigation? Well, it, it gives you a, certainly a place to start because that's a that's as big a red flag as you're going to get. Yeah, um, that's huge. That's huge. yeah. You drop you drop everything else and you focus on that 190 percent on that. Yes, sir. You drop it open, yes, but sir. and look at this though start. the uh, the COE saying uh, as a disclaimer that we have not independently confirmed that, but uh, you are hearing that. Uh, and she was supposed to have a supervised visitation, but we're. According Sweet to uh, Laura V, uh, got out of jail the day before this happened. So that is a red flag that we're hearing about at the one hour and 17 minute mark of this show. Uh, Pamela Barker saying, uh, no, I just brought up the wrong comment because of this. We all carry uh, Second Amendment concealed carry weapons and are not afraid to use them in Oklahoma. Um, so if there was a random abductor, that could have been a problem if they were, uh, caring, um, Dr. Michaela, Sarah Mosing, uh, awesome to have her on the show for the first time. She is the owner of the largest Oklahoma owned private investigation and process serving company in the state. And as you heard, she bought a hundred, 160,000 acres. So you said, um, it was 160 acres, 160 acres, 160 is still a lot of acres. Um, uh, Dr. Sarah Mosing, your uh, your gut instinct on this. Um, obviously, we're just getting word about this uh, baby daddy. That could be a whole game changer. But your final thoughts? Well, I mean, I agree with uh, both of the others. I think that it's very troubling that that one of the mothers got out 
you know, just like the day before everybody went missing. And I think it's very tr troubling in a, that this happened three miles away from where they were going to pick up the kids in a town this small where everybody knows everybody else. I mean, there are quite a few red flags, possibly a strong pop, possibly indicating toward the family, definitely something to check out right away if they haven't already. Uh, thank you, Dr. Michaela. Uh, again, awesome to have her and her cat on the show. Uh, loving today's guest, so intelligent and experienced. Uh, thank you. Uh, Detective Phil Ramos, we learned something new about him every time. Last time it was Ray Garcia was his alias when he was undercover. Phil, in, in New York City, they call them uncles, the un the undercovers. Do you guys call it that in, in Vegas? No. You no, don't? I don't know. Okay. I've never heard that term, though. Uh -uh. Oh, really? In New York City, yeah, the NYPD calls their undercovers uncles. So um, there you go. I know some random bit of information. But uh, Phil uh, Ramos, what's that? <laughs> We get called prima donnas out here because we have the <laughs> undercover cars and the undercover apartments and credit cards, and we go into bars and drink with bad guys. <laughs> uh, Bill Ramos, 35 years of service, the last 15 years in homicide. He has done it all. He's even infiltrated the Cuban mob. Who can say that? Still rides his Harley, makes Carm nervous. Three-time Officer of the Year Award and a native Las Vegan. Uh, Phil, your uh, gut on this one and your final thoughts. Well, that, that last little note from the COE just sent chills, man. So this is going to be a ugly, bad ending. It, it, it doesn't look good at all. That, and that's my sense of it. Uh, wow. You can bet if that information came out and was uh, made public, if, if it was accurate and if it's confirmed, um, it's bad news for both these women. Uh, you never want to hear that um horrific uh phil to you a uh, final question obviously these kids had to be with someone i think they were with grandma because if the if the baby daddy was in jail i assume you're really digging into that aspect as well where were these two children staying right who yeah, was their party? absolutely and why were they staying there were, were they staying with someone on the mom's side or were they staying with someone from baby daddy's side um that that could be a that could be an indication of which way to look as well. Uh, question is still pouring in here as, as we say goodbye. Detective Ramos, how long is it before a case goes cold? It all depends on the circumstances. It could be uh, a year. It could be three years. As long as you still have something to follow up on, it's not a cold case. When you run out of leads, run out of people to interview, and there's nothing left to do except wait for that phone call, then it becomes a cold case. It all depends on the circumstances of the case and the evidence that you have. On that note, everyone, tomorrow, by the way, we're picking up with uh, Sebastian Rogers, the 15-year-old uh, boy with autism who has been missing since the uh, end of February, I think, it's, or maybe the beginning of February, because I'm getting two cases mixed up. But uh, we will be following that case uh, tomorrow with uh, Dr. Detective Troy Looney, who is supposed to come on, and uh, hopefully a few other uh, amazing guests. But uh, appreciate this panel being here, Dr. Michaela, Keith, Sarah Mosing. Detective Phil Ramos, Dr. Roger Rhodes. Love you, America. Love you, Ada, Oklahoma. Love you wherever Dr. Sarah Mosing is from in Oklahoma. Of course, Las Vegas. And let's please keep uh, these two women uh, top of mind here. Veronica Butler, 27. Jillian Kelly, 39. If anyone knows anything about either of them or their uh, whereabouts, you're asked to call the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. Uh, guests, stick around one second. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Love you.